Welcome in, everyone. Hey, everybody. This is Everything Sucks, Let's Fix It, episode 13. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. We've got a little bit of a different setup today. Um, I'm actually in Anthony's home yeah. in, on Long Island. This has been so hectic getting this all set up, but we're here now and I'm happy to be talking. So this is good. And just so you know, and I probably should let you know this before we started recording, your collars popped on your jacket. Oh my God. Yeah, so you might want to you work on that. You know what sucks? Every time we start to record, your collars always pop in your jacket and I always remind, I always tell you, dude. Yeah. I'm so self-absorbed that I didn't even notice. <laughs> Well, um, thanks for not letting me go through the whole episode like that. You would look cool. I was getting like a Dracula. Wow. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, we got a, a ton of current events. First of all, before we get into current events, I want to say how happy I am with all the new people who have joined um, and started following us. We got a lot of great traction on TikTok, a lot of great followers on YouTube, and I really appreciate that, guys. I love that you love the content. We love doing this. So it's so cool seeing so many people care what we have to say yeah his excitement is is like childlike and really beautiful to it see so is. i appreciate all of you guys doing that for anthony yeah thanks because yeah. i don't care how he feels <laughs> yeah no one does <laughs> you shouldn't so we're good to go okay current events so mm -hmm. what's big in the news ben has anything <laughs> happened this week i don't even know if this counts as big anymore yeah true um because we have a fourth trump indictment uh this one was really sprawling mm -hmm. uh i think 18 people total were indicted in these charges 41 total counts um the first one which is racketeering which violates george's rico statute is really the bombshell to me because it's basically this this georgia da is saying trump and all of these other people conspired in a criminal enterprise to yeah. overthrow the correct results of the 2021 election. Yeah, I mean, it's a sprawling indictment, right? 2020 election. Yeah, yes. it's a sprawling indictment. I think, like, this is the one that Trump has the most to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. I think, like, it's interesting because this one is the only one that's coming. Well, this one in New York is coming from a state. But this one carries with it a lot of jail time if it, if he's found to be, if he's found guilty and is convicted, right? Yeah. And because this is a state uh, case, if he wins the election, he can't pardon himself from this one. Yeah. So this is the one where it's like he has no federal way of getting out. He can't really even appeal to the Supreme Court because it's all state stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is really the one that he's really been worried about the whole time, I think. And I think because of that, it's really weird that this is the fourth indictment and with it has the most fatigue yeah. that comes with it, yeah. right? Even though it is the biggest, most sprawling and kind of most uh, like as a, far as a story, it yeah. feels like the most important grandiose thing that has happened um it's still going to get the least attention and i think like the most amount of people interviewed on the street who wouldn't be able to tell you what's actually in it oh no i mean it's a long indictment it's like 90 pages how much of that is full text probably around like 40 hmm. maybe 50 but like a lot of it is just like you know legal organization rather than actual details yeah but it's long i well, mean it's long the vast majority too is the first count yeah. which is just the racketeering which kind of shocked me so with with this charge um most of the the overt acts that they call out in in the legal speak that contribute to the conspiracy basically to overthrow the election totally would not be against the law themselves like mm -hmm. you have a bunch of trump tweets that are included in here but the idea is that put together these all build the case that yes they were trying to right it tells a story yeah so like people people online i hear like oh man they indicted trump for tweets no they didn't try indict him for the tweets they used the tweets to paint a story of how he was manipulating and conspiring a much larger more nefarious act of trying to steal the election yeah totally to, to say it's just the tweets is absolutely wrong because there are 161 unique over acts cited in yeah. the indictment as contributing to this which is wild and and rudy giuliani and mark meadows are main characters we've been waiting for the mark well. meadows endorsement i was shocked to see mark meadows not in jack smith's indictment yeah but now he's in this it makes a little more sense mm -hmm. um yeah, I, Giuliani, I've, I've heard reports that he's going to like be going broke fighting this. Like he has no more cash on hand. Yeah. Well, he doesn't get a super PAC to pay all of his legal fees. Right. He's not using campaign money to fund his legal things. Listen, yeah. if you're donating to Trump and you're cool with him spending his campaign funds on legal fees, that's fine. You do you. 
but that's I, crazy to me. I mean, I assume they are. Yeah, I assume they are too. Yeah. You know? Um, um, but no, I think like this is going to be the case to watch. I think like Georgia also televises all of their cases. Mm. So this will be televised. I saw a tentative date for mid-March. I saw that too. For this, I also saw that some experts think that's a little ambitious. Mm -hmm. It probably won't happen. Jack Smith is pushing for a January trial. Yeah. Which is also ambitious. But like the thing with the Jack Smith thing is if Trump pushes for a date that's so far back from the election, the judge is going to see that as him just trying to wait until the election happens Mm -hmm. and then maybe be more like aggressive against him mm-hmm. and go on more towards jack smith's side if he overplays his hand and goes so far past the election yeah so it's a game that they have to play to figure out the dates but i hope they i mean i hope they come out january march that'd be awesome yeah it, it gets it gets scarier to me the closer it gets to the election because yeah. then the more that public opinion is going to say this is uh, a democratic president and department of justice persecuting a political enemy right and then who knows what kind of unrest will result from that. No, I know. It's already a nightmare. And like I think that we talked about this last week, but jailing Trump helps his poll numbers. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think these indictments are helping his poll numbers too. So Marist released a poll today. Uh, Marist College is an A-minus rated pollster. It's a very good pollster. Mm. Um, and they had Trump only trailing Joe Biden by one point. And he was winning independence by eight in that poll. Marist is a great pollster. So seeing that is really shocking. Yeah. And I and this isn't after the fourth indictment. This is only after the third. But even so, three indictments in and you're winning independence by eight. Even if that data is a little wrong, that's telling a story. You know, that says something. That means that the independents are still up in the air and haven't written them off yet. Yeah. Yeah, which I suppose doesn't surprise me. And that's, that's where really only a conviction, I think, will move the needle. Yeah, I think so, too. I think, yeah, after a conviction, I think a lot of those Republicans who are still voting for Trump, um, not half, not even 75 percent, but a good 20 percent of Republicans, if he gets convicted, is like, yeah, I'm done. Oh, well, I, I think the independents. Oh, the independents, like, for yeah, sure. That yeah, that 8 percent lead independents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's gone if he gets convicted. If he gets convicted, right? Who knows? But mm-hmm. definitely go and read the indictments for yourself if you have the time. They're, the the third one with Jack Smith is very interesting, very eye-opening. The third, the fourth one, this Georgia one, is a little less exciting, a yeah. little less because it's just a list of yeah thing after thing. And it's I not all about thing. no, I didn't, I couldn't. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not all about Trump. The fourth one is like you know, there's so many other names that honestly I don't even know that it's like I'm not uh, I, the amount of information you need to go into this story is insane. Yeah, you know the amount of context you need to understand. Yeah. Um. But again, like this whole Georgia thing, this wouldn't have happened if he didn't try to appoint the fake electors. Mm-hmm. Like if he just went out and he was saying like, I won the election, the election was rigged, it's all fake. It's your legal right to do that. You can do that. No one is saying that he couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. It's the conspiring to formulate a slate of fake electors submitting forged and improper paperwork, persuading and threatening um officials in government yeah. going after the secretary of state threatening him with uh, prosecution threatening him with jail time um that makes you go to jail guys i don't know what to tell you yeah i mean you yeah. can go to jail for five years for forging one vote this guy tried to steal an election you think he shouldn't go to jail i don't know yeah well this that's why i even though I, it just seems extremely likely because i didn't go deep in i don't want to pretend that i yeah i'm a legal expert and i know exactly what should happen but, yeah, I'm not going to say he... Sh- I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. It, it seems... I don't know. It seems extremely likely. And, I mean, the the pressuring Mike Pence, which yeah. Pence is on record for saying, and it does absolutely nothing positive for Pence to be out with that. No. I mean, and when Pence, when Pence says... When Pence recorded that Trump said, you're too honest, what does that mean, you're too honest? Mm. What does that mean? Yeah. Like, obviously, that means, like, you're too honest to play the game. Trump's, so there was an article in The Economist this week, because I'm one of the nerds who actually reads ma- printed magazines, um, and they were talking about Trump's only way out. And they said, like, the only thing that could possibly help him, that this is from The Economist's opinion, is if Trump gets at least one member of the jury on the trial to believe that he genuinely believed the election was stolen, and you only need one jurist to not make a decision because they need to be unanimous, and you yeah. can have a hung jury, and then he could be free. Right, so that's the only thing he has to do, and mm-hmm. that's going to be a pretty hard 
I mean, I don't know. Maybe it won't be that hard. We'll see. But that's like, I think that's going to be the, that's going to be the defense strategy going forward. Yeah. And that's why on Monday, he's going to release a whole report and give a big speech about how the election was stolen. And he's going to rehash the whole 2020 election because he's trying to paint this image of himself that he really thinks it was stolen. That's Mm -hmm. what he's trying to do when he does this. Um, You know, who knows what he actually thinks, but. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I want to talk a little bit more about polls because our favorite Putting fingers, Ron DeSantis, meatball Ron, as we like to call him. I want to point out, I posted a video on on YouTube this week uh, that was a clip of us talking about Ron DeSantis, and I titled it "The Downfall or the Downward Spiral of Ronald DeSantis," and I was just extremely proud of myself <laughs> yeah, for calling really him good. Ronald. I love that. Yeah, I love it so much. Let's keep calling him Ronald. Yeah. So Ronald is collapsing. <laughs> And it's so bad now, a poll came out that had him in third place behind Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. We had Trump at 60, Vivek at like 13%, and then we had our boy Meatball Ronald (laughs) at 8%. And that's just so funny to me that he's getting beat by some 20-something, 30-something-year-old guy nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. And And now here he is. And he has an enormous war chest. This also gives us an opportunity to talk about Vivek. And that's what I wanted to do. I want to talk about Vivek. Yeah, because we have... So we've talked about him pretty extensively Mm -hmm. behind the scenes. I think the campaign he's running is very interesting. I think kind of presents a new important directions for political campaigns to go. Yeah. Um, if you, if you ever listen to him speak and honestly, I would, I would recommend like getting exposure to him on, on podcasts or YouTube videos that are more intimate settings, like where he's in person with people rather than if he's being interviewed on Fox or MSNBC or anything, because I, I truly believe that Vivek, believes in the policies that he's talking about he often has gone really deep in knowledge he often comes to conclusions that i staunchly disagree with yeah but the reason that he's polling so well and that he's been shooting up in the polls for a long time i think is because his authenticity is is quite palpable yeah you, um, you hear him talk and you know that he is saying what he believes even if you think is wrong yeah. He's saying what he truly thinks. And people appreciate that. And I think I think that is like the counter swamp attitude. Yeah. Like I think I think the the money behind politics is one thing, and Vivek also like Trump kind of seems like he can be in a different lane from the super PACs because he's rich individually and he's putting a lot of personal money into it. Yeah. But I think more what people are tired of is is hearing these clearly contrived speeches Mm. right all the time which just makes them seem like these politicians seem like they don't give a shit yeah about what actually happens right and all they're doing is image management constantly um and i think it's it's an important thing for liberals and conservatives to take away from this this new image because it's not it's not the trump populism of of i'll just say whatever i want um it's it's intelligent speaking and it's policy based but it's also authentic not constructive not constructive it's a good way. It, it doesn't seem like when he talks it doesn't seem like it was put, sentences put together by a pollster yes you know um and so many politicians will just live and die but what the polls number tell them to say but No, Vivek will come on and say some whack stuff that you never thought of before. And sometimes he makes a great point. Yeah. And you're kind of like taken aback. I mean, he, he, one thing that he's pushing for is a streamlined immigration process. Yeah. That gets high skilled, high value immigrants into the country. And I think that's like a great idea. I think that's so important. We have a shortage of a lot of high skilled workers. And if he wants to be a part of a bipartisan coalition that wants to bring in high skilled workers i'm down you know yeah and he specifically said that those high that the the skilled workers that he's looking for are not just the people who are going to sit in the silicon valley offices right it's people with skills matched to the jobs that we have right which is exactly the immigration policy that we need it's exactly the immigration policy that we need he also bucks trump on a couple things that i find interesting he's also pro the trans-pacific partnership yeah. We've talked about that on the show previously. It's kind of like an economic block with a lot of Pacific Island nations in the United States. It was introduced by Obama, fought for Obama, 
um, and then Trump killed it when he came into the White House. I'm mixed on the TPP. I'm not totally for it. I'm not totally against it. At the time when Trump pulled out of the TPP, I was glad Trump did that. But now Vivek Ramaswamy, he's running in the Republican primary, and he wants to bring back the TPP. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. The one other thing I'll mention about him, um, and I mentioned this to Anthony, Vivek went on another liberal show, the David Pakman show, and uh, he got interviewed for like half an hour. And at the end of the show, the thing that he signed off with was saying, I think that people on both sides have gotten pretty lazy politically and that we look for the weak arguments Mm. of the opposing side and we like to kind of just dunk on that. These are not his exact words. I'm totally paraphrasing. Um, But then he said, I want us to instead look for the best argument that the other side has and respond to that. And that really resonated with me. And I just want to kind of signal boost that because I find that that is what makes everyone a more intelligent and more open-minded conversationalist and voter. Totally. Like we always hear online the term straw man. You straw man my argument, right? You're putting up a scarecrow that's really easy to knock down. Yep. We need steel men, right? We want to be building like steel men of our opponents. That's really hard to take down. And then it's, it, it, listen, if you want to take your opponent down, then it's really rewarding when you do. Yes. But you also learn a lot. When you, when you fight the straw man, you learn nothing. So Vivek going on with that is a great message. Yeah. And he's one to watch. I mean, Democrats better watch out for him in the next four years because he's not going to run, he's not going to win the nomination this time, but four years from now, if he's the future of the Republican Party, Democrats are in trouble 100%. Yeah. And I, I mean, personally, total opinion, I think he would absolutely take the Republican nomination in yeah. 28. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think like, I mean, it's not going to be Pence. It's not Ronald. So it's, I don't know. No. No, Vivek is one to watch, man. Yeah. Um, other big news. We got Ohio election. I want to talk about that first. Yes. Let's go into Ohio. So Ohio had uh, one question on their ballot in August, their August primary, um, and it is dis- changing. It's an amendment to the Constitution to change the requirements to change the Constitution from a fifty percent plus one to a sixty percent at the ballot at the ballot box, right? So if you want to change the Ohio Constitution right now, you get a certain number of signatures. It goes on the ballot. You only need 50% plus one of the vote, and then the Constitution's changed. Republicans were pushing to get it changed from 50% to 60% plus one and increase the number of signatures you needed to get that question on the ballot. Why did the Republicans do this? Because it's important to put this in context. Republicans did this because there is a referendum on the November ballot to codify the right uh, to an abortion, uh, right for abortion in the Ohio Constitution. The Republicans wanted to raise the amendment requirement from 50 to 60 percent to stop that referendum from being victorious in the November election. Um, The Republicans have said that that was not the reason, that it's to protect the state from outside money, which doesn't make any sense in my opinion. Um, They've been saying that it over represents city voters. That also doesn't make sense. It's one person, one vote. It's just a power grab to stop abortion from getting codified. that being said, Republicans got their clocks cleaned. Yeah, 57% no to 43% yes. I mean, the election was called in like 30 minutes. It was I, I was watching it come in. 30 minutes after the election results started rolling in, we found out that it was over. I mean, the no side, the pro-abortion side, kind of, the pro-abortion side um, was winning counties that Trump won. Yeah. You know? To, to me, this, this reiterates the power of the... Um, your right to abortion is getting taken away from you, that messaging. Um, They worked hard in Ohio to organize people in preparation for this vote. Yeah. Uh, But also, like, even though this is a proxy for the abortion vote, the idea of kind of making the constitutional, the state constitutional process less democratic, I think that must be hard to sell people on. Yeah, and I I think a lot of Republicans who were probably for an abortion restriction, a part of them deep inside them was like, I don't want to make it harder to change my constitution. Mm -hmm. Like as a Republican who's a freedom-loving guy who flies the American flag, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonated with people. And, you know, so in the November election, I actually don't suspect the abortion referendum to win by 57%. I expect it to win by 54, right? I expect there to be like a 6% difference of people 
a six point difference who were Republicans who don't want abortion in the state, but didn't like the attack on democracy. And that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the the Republicans, the reason they went for this probably is because they also expect more turnout from Democrats who are worried about not having the right to an abortion than Republicans that care that much to preventing abortions. No, definitely. Right. And they actually stopped August primaries. This will be the last August primary. Yeah. Ever. Which is in funny because that the the previous law to stop August votes came from the Republicans and now they're the ones who wanted to set up this August vote. It's almost like it's all for political convenience and none of it's for principle almost, right? <laughs> Weird. Weird how that yeah. works out. Um uh no, I think it was really interesting. The counties that went no were the most likely to vote for Sherrod Brown in the 2018 Senate race. And a lot of them were counties that Biden lost in 2020. Oh. So that is going to be the next thing that I want to talk about probably next week hmm. is I want to talk, do a little bit of a deeper dive on the Ohio Senate election in 2024, where Sherrod Brown, who was the current incumbent, Democrat incumbent, stands a chance of winning, how he needs to overperform Biden in certain areas of the state why he might, why he might not. Um, but this is going to give us good insight. And the November election with the November abortion referendum, that will give us a lot of insight. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in the state of Ohio. It's one of the states that I like doing data analysis and political analysis on the most out of all of them. Um, so I definitely want to talk about that a lot as we go forward. <laughs> that had to be one of the nerdiest things you ever said. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> love Ohio. It's one of the states that I like doing political analysis in. <laughs> Out of all of them, <laughs> like, I've done political analysis of on every state. Yeah, it's like it's like yeah. Oh my god, it's like on my on my Instagram, my bio is Ohio political analysis. Enjoy your what's yours? What's your favorite state to do political analysis on? Yeah, oh, that's great. All right, now let's stick on abortion because I want to go. We haven't really talked about abortion on this show, mm -mm. and one of the reasons I feel like we haven't is because it's very divisive. And one of the things that we've been trying to do on this show is be like fairly inclusive to a lot of different sides of the political spectrum. Um, but I think it's time we have to talk about abortion because there's a story that the Times reported on um, about a 13-year-old girl who was raped in Mississippi. And um, it's just a, it's a tragedy. And I, I want to run through a little bit of her story. So um, the Time did not give her name uh, to keep her identity a secret, but we're going to call her Ashley. Um, and in the fall of 2022, uh, she was raped by a stranger in her yard outside of her home, and she was afraid to tell. She was afraid to tell anybody. So we didn't. She didn't tell her mom. She didn't tell her dad. She didn't tell anyone, and she kept it to herself. And her whole personality changed. Um, she stopped leaving her room. She stopped talking. She was already shy, but she became almost mute after this experience. And what's so sad is the mom never told her daughter. Regina is the mom's name for this story. Regina never told Ashley how babies were made because she thought kids just need to be kids. And, you know, she didn't need to learn that yet. So Ashley didn't even know that what happened to her could result in pregnancy. She had no idea. She had no idea where any of it came from. So she went to the hospital after a lot of excruciating pain. And when they did an ultrasound, they found out she was 10 to 11 weeks pregnant. Um, Regina had no clue. She felt horrible. Um, and Ashley would not answer any questions. She wouldn't open her mouth. She had a blank face. She could not understand what was happening to her. Um, and so, uh, where does abortion come into this? Seven months earlier, um, the nurse could have directed Ashley to abortion clinics in Memphis that were 90 minutes away or Jackson, Mississippi, which were two and a half hours away. But today, Ashley lives in the heart of abortion ban America. In 2018, Republican lawmakers of Mississippi enacted a ban on most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, and the law, uh, originally the law was blocked, but um, when the court overturned Roe v. Wade, this ban went into effect. Um, the closest abortion clinic to Ashley and Regina was Chicago. To get to Chicago, they would have had to drive for nine hours, um, would have had to stay at multiple hotels, would have had to pay for food. And Regina would have had to miss work, which was not an option. So they could not go get an abortion. It was not an option to them. Uh, they could not drive up to Chicago. Couldn't happen. This is a this is a result of theocratic policies taking over medical 
procedures that has now forced 13-year-old children to carry their rapist's baby to term. And in a state like Mississippi, it's the worst state of all because black women in Mississippi are four times as likely to die from pregnancy related to complications as white women. Um, Mississippi has the highest maternal mortality rate compared to any other state or second highest or something like that. And it also has a very, very low population of doctors. Now, what's interesting about the Mississippi abortion ban is that it does contain uh, an exception for rape. Uh, it does. Um, but Ashley did not have any proof of rape. She did not have a police report. And she had no evidence of her rape, so, she, so no doctor would have performed an abortion on her as if they were to do so and they couldn't prove the rape, they could go to jail. Even if the victim files a police report, the uh, Times reporter found that there is no clear process for granting an exemption. The Times reached out to the attorney general's office and the attorney general did not return Times repeated requests to clarify the process on how to get exceptions. And even if they did get an exception, there are no abortion providers left in the state of Mississippi to even do them. So it's not even possible to get them even if so. Um, this is the last uh, thing I'll say about the story of Ashley, okay? This is the last paragraph of the Times article. There is only one moment when Ashley smiles a little, and it's when she describes the nurses she met in the doctor's office and delivery room. One of them she remembers was nice and cool. She has decided that when she grows up, she wants to be a nurse too, to help people, she says. For a second, she looks like any other soon-to-be seventh grader, sharing her childhood dream. Then, Peanut, the child, stirs in his car seat. Regina says the baby needs to be fed. Ashley's face goes blank again. She is now a mother. And, you know, this poor child's life has been taken away from her by a rapist, has left her with a forever reminder of her trauma, um, and has taken her innocence. And Republicans forced her to keep that um, constant reminder and has totally changed her life. I think it's crazy that we've allowed this to happen. And like, I'm happy to see that there's political backlash against it. But there are still so many people who don't think of this as like, I don't know, evil. And I, it's just disheartening to see so many people that are comfortable with this. Well, I think we can still talk about it from two perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, the, the people who don't think it's evil are seeing it from the perspective of, oh, Peanut gets to live now. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to try to address that because I've, I've thought a lot about this and I can't, I honestly can't quite come to a solid logical consistency. Yeah. All I know is it makes more sense to me that we are taking into account the person who has some stock in the future of their life and some awareness of it, right? And that is Ashley in this case. Mm -hmm. Ashley is the person who has to deal with the dread of living with this baby, of having her life completely changed. And many people, including me, would say ruined by having to have it. Peanut, if aborted, has to suffer none of that at all peanut isn't worried about how life is going to go peanut isn't aware that its potential life is about to be eliminated if it's aborted um and that's why i think we don't need to worry about these fetuses in abortion it's because the the consciousness the awareness that a mother has and the suffering that comes with that is something that we should protect against more than we protect against these this collection of cells, which has absolutely no concept of what life or existence is. Mm -hmm. I think like I I want I, I want to talk about the exceptions for rape 
that are that's in this Mississippi ban, right? Mm. Because I think this this example shows you that all those exceptions are just total bullshit. The exceptions are just to make better PR for what these laws actually are, and they are just abortion bans. All of the abortion clinics in Mississippi have closed because that of the of the ban. Even if you wanted to get an abortion in Mississippi, you genuinely can't because all the clinics have closed down, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you have to prove that you got raped. Already super hard because half of rapes don't get solved in the United States. There's a backlog of rape kits that need to be tested going back months, years. The police department doesn't have the time to go and find every rapist because there's too many of them. So putting that type of pressure on a 13-year-old girl to have to prove that her rapist did that to her in order for her to get an abortion and not even have a process clear in the state mm -hmm. to get that exception just goes to show you that the theocrats who pass these types of laws, I'm not as nice as you, these theocrats who pass these types of laws are not genuinely looking out for the life of the mother, not genuinely looking out for the rape victim. They're looking to uphold their religious beliefs that a woman's place is to make children and that they don't have autonomy over their own body. That's their agenda. It's nothing else. And I honestly, I, ref I almost refuse to entertain a difference of their agenda when it comes to this issue. Um, I think people may be misled on it, but at the end of the day, the, the, the religiosity of the movement is pushing to, and that's a, that's a, that's a shame because I consider myself a religious person and I would never force a 13 year old child to carry their rapist baby to term and push for an agenda that takes away a woman's autonomy and only makes her no less than a baby factory because some book that was written 2000 years ago told me to do so even though it didn't. Yeah, I know. I think I agree with you on that. I think that the agenda, the motivations here are entirely religion based. Totally. I think that's the only reason that you kind of, you lose the nuance of taking into account the plight of the mother mm -hmm. for the soul, like benefit of the life of the, of the seed inside or the, the fetus. It sounded weird. I don't the like seed. that I said that. Yeah, I don't like you said um, seed either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just like like a collection of cells. Fetus almost seems like too much. Like is what, it what fetus is? eye? No. <laughs> um, the 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 one thing that came to mind when you're saying that is the so what is the policy effectively? Right. Right. And what's interesting as you say that is it's effectively the rich can get abortions and the poor can't. Right. Because of the states that the abortion bans are implemented in and this isn't across the board because like there are a bunch of rich people in florida say and, and because desantis is the governor there it has some of the strictest uh, abortion bans in the country but the rich people can leave and get an abortion elsewhere they can fly to chicago yeah right and the poor are the only ones who are going to be financially restricted from doing that um which again when you think about it effectively like how it actually will play out it kind of is this terrifying image of society that you're now visualizing where poor women who already are probably struggling to support themselves are going to be forced to have children that they don't want and struggle that much more to support themselves and the child yeah uh uh, it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah. And I want to talk more about the effectiveness. What effect does this have? Well, last week we talked about the doctor shortage in America, and there is no place that's worse for the doctor shortage than Mississippi, right? Mississippi, if you want to be a doctor, you get the paid, you get paid almost the most in the, in the country to go to Mississippi because they're so low on doctors. They asked and they surveyed uh, uh, people in medical school where they would be most likely to apply to residency. And 60% of respondents said they were unlike unlikely to apply to any residency program in states with abortion restrictions. These states are now going to have a hard time getting more doctors in there and affect their entire healthcare system because of their religiosity yeah. and their belief that women are baby factories. Mm. And now they're going to have another shortage of doctors because of it. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, we need to bring Roe v. Wade back. Yeah. It has to happen. That's for sure. Roe v. Wade was a consensus we've had for decades. And 
it's unbelievably popular in this country. It needs to be brought back immediately. That's what, that's what I have on abortion. Well spoken. Thanks, man. Let's get into some actual good news. Yeah. Something getting fixed. Yeah, right? Okay. So we have a youth climate movement sues um, a Montana governor, and they actually win. So 16 kids uh, came together with another nonprofit legal group called Our Children's Trust um, to sue the state of Montana um, for their restrictions for why do they sue montana they claim that montana's permissive approach to fossil fuel mining drilling and combustion violated their constitutional rights and on june 12th their case became the first youth climate case to go to trial in u.s history and on august 14th two days ago they won which is so badass yeah it's so badass the judge declares that the state violated their constitutional rights to equal protection, dignity, liberty, health, and safety, and public trust, all of which are predicated on their right to a clean and healthful environment. The, yeah. This is this is potentially huge, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. If, if a precedent comes from this, the the sweeping changes that might be made even at the executive level only the executive level because of it will be gargantuan and so i i'd worry at the federal level because i feel like if something like this goes to the supreme court or if uh if the president tries to make executive orders based on a ruling like this Mm -hmm. then suddenly they're going to bring up major questions doctrine and they're going to say no you can't you can't act too much on it but I, I have some hope. This, I, this no, is a listen, good direction. I have hope. I mean, if this if this type of demand gets to the EPA and the EPA has this directive mm-hmm. to protect the climate because it, it affects your right to equal um, liberty and all that, dude, the EPA could go off on regulating carbon emissions. Yeah. Right? Um, so previously with Montana State Energy Policy, they forbid, they basically um, forbid the state from considering the impact of greenhouse gas emissions completely and climate change and all their environmental rules. So all of it, like if there was a new drilling, if there was a new mine, you could not think about the carbon impact. It wasn't allowed. That's now going to be gone. Um, This is still Montana. It's still a Republican controlled state. So like whether or not they're going to go pushing climate change initiatives through, probably not. But the fact that this was able to happen is a massive win. The reason that this this group, the Our Children's Trust, targeted Montana specifically was because in the Montana Constitution, they had the right to a clean and healthful environment. So this clause being in the Constitution gave these children and this um, legal group the opportunity to get in there and make something like this happen. Yeah. Um, I'm... I don't know what else to say. Well, now we can move on to some other interesting news about climate change that you have about carbon capture, ah, which last sure. week I kind of called that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So so last week we talked, what context did we discuss it in? We were talking about carbon capture and because they... Um, was it it was it off the back of our agricultural... Yeah, it was off yeah. the back of the agricultural thing with the sequestration. Yes, yes, with the sequestration. Um so we mentioned carbon capture as a potential solution or part of the solution to climate change. The technology is basically sucks carbon dioxide out of the air and puts it into the dirt. Um, and it can stay there pretty much indefinitely. Well, recently, the Biden administration awarded over $3 billion to new direct air capture, carbon capture projects which is by far the biggest amount of funding that's ever been put into this technology across the world. Um, However, last week, when we talked about this, Anthony caveated with, we don't want this technology to be used to justify the further burning of fossil fuels. So I read, I'm reading this article about, oh, this is awesome. $3 $3 billion is going into carbon capture technology. And I read it, I'm like, okay, who's getting this? And the company is Occidental Petroleum, which is an enormous, <laughs> no. 
oil company whose CEO has specifically talked several times about how carbon capture is going to enable them to sell and burn more oil for a long time. This is not good, guys. Yeah. So this is we've been pro Biden often on the show. This is a big anti Biden. This, this is point. an anti Biden moment. We are hopping off of Joe Biden's dick for this moment. Yes. Yeah. What is he doing? Biden's Department of Energy fucked up on this <laughs> one. Okay. I mean, I, I almost like I wonder where are they coming from, and it has to be because there aren't that many companies doing this, and there are even less doing it at scale. So there are even less that can really even take this amount of funding to scale up their projects. This is probably the only company that has the infrastructure ready to go. Yeah. Right? This is the only company that even has remotely the capability to do something like this. Yes. And of course, it only got that by having the investment from the oil company. Yeah. So they're in this difficult position, but I, I think the answer is spread out smaller investments to multiple players across the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Do not reward oil companies just for buying up these small startups with money that's kind of pocket change to them oh, yeah. so that they can keep burning oil that's that's exactly the way to not to run on a treadmill we're running the this is the opposite incentive that we want to be formulating right yeah now. this is this is a really bad carrot we always talk about carrot and the stick right we always yeah. talk about do we incentivize behavior or do we punish bad behavior this is terrible incentivized behavior right now yeah um and this is like why the term net zero really pisses me off sometimes because the company is justifying like oh we can emit more carbon into the atmosphere as long as we suck out the same amount yeah that's not the point we're trying to reduce the amount of carbon you yeah. know what i mean we're not and well the thing is theoretically to me i i'm i'm fine at net zero if you if you are actually yeah, pulling you're the actually same amount, net, yeah. but i i think almost any expert and i would say that it's so unlikely that they're going to happen so instead this is buying political will yeah this, this is, is just yeah it's lengthening kind of the the wiggle room that they get to play with the government and permitting more projects no these companies i don't trust any of these oil companies these oil companies should not be allowed to profit off of the catastrophic effects of climate change that they created yeah these companies need to be sued these companies need to be litigated against these uh, the executives disbanded, need to go to disbanded dissolved dis disbanded dissolved nationalized maybe <laughs> these companies gotta go they can no longer be allowed to exist after they've put the world in an apocalyptic situation Okay. Yeah. There's no reason for us to throw $3 billion at them. They, we cannot reward them for this. They should go to jail. Amen. Amen. That's a clip right there. <laughs> <laughs> clip that. Clip that, please. Okay. Editor? We don't have an editor. We don't have an <laughs> editor. Only, I if wish any, we did. If, if anyone any will edit for us pro bono, um, <laughs> please. please reach out. When we start making money off it, you can profit too. If you want to do it now for free, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, do you have anything else about climate change? No, we should move on. Okay. I, I'm really interested in what's going on in Germany right now. Um, the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, we've talked about them previously in the past. Briefly. Briefly. Um, they are Germany's far-right party. So you have the left party, Die Link, on the far left. Then you have the Social Democrats. Then you have the Free German Party, the FDP. Then you have the Greens. Then you have the CDU, which is like the conservative party, but like, pretty like right center right party and then you have the afd the far right now previously the afd was kind of like shoved off to the side nobody liked the afd the cdu the the right the, the center right and the spd the center left agreed that they're not going to work with the afd under any circumstance but there's cracks forming in that wall now, the CDU has said that the center-right is willing to join the AFD in local elections to form majorities at the local level, in city elections. This is a crack in the wall that he's testing to see if he can get away with it. Because I believe genuinely that if they could, they would. But they know it's not politically acceptable yet, so they're just trying to test the waters, see mm. what they can do. But there has been some movement over the last year, year and a half, that's putting the AFD in a real difficult position. A German court ruled in 2022 that the far-right alternative for Germany can be classified as a suspected threat to democracy, and this paves the way for domestic intelligence agencies to spy on the party. It not only does that, the AFD, uh, it not only does that, okay, they, it now is spreading the the, it's laying the seeds for a possible ban of the party entirely 
So during the post-war constitution, um, the domestic intelligence agency called the Protection of the Constitution um, is it operates as this early warning system for when a democratic order is being overthrown. And this institution has the authority to ban political parties. They've done so in the past. They've banned the Communist Party in the 50s, and they've banned a neo-Nazi party in the 50s. Now they're, they're looking and they suggest that they might do so again. Okay, the, um, here is one political figure, um, Saskia Eskin. Uh, they were a co-leader of Chancellor uh, Sholos Social Democratic Party, the center left. I have to correct how you just said that. How Chancellor to... Olaf Schultz. You said well, Chancellor Sholoff. That's depressing. You uh, just mixed his two names. That was and great. you know what? After all the great things I've said, he's going to make that into the clip. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, he told, uh, they told the German press that if it, it, it was her view that the AFD had an anti-constitutional aim, and if it could be proved, the party should be banned. There were also some Christian Democrats that argued the party is a threat to democracy and should be banned as well. So this is causing, obviously, an outroar um, in the AFD. But I want to spread some awareness of how truly dangerous the AFD is from my perspective, okay? Um, correct my pronunciation of this. But in 2017, uh, Thuringia... <laughs> <laughs> I don't see where you are. Hopefully uh, I can. In, in bullet point that starts with in 2017. Okay. All right. Okay. Page what? I don't know. Uh, Thuringia? I think you, you did pretty well. All right, all right. So in 2017, uh, the regional leader of Thuringia, uh, Bjorn Hock, challenged Germany's remembrance culture. Um, what does this mean? He called the Berlin site uh, dedicated to honoring the millions of Jewish people killed in the Holocaust a monument of shame. Um, not only that, uh, Hock's book asked eight FD members to guess. So then this is this is the next part, okay? In 2019, a public broadcaster took sentences from Hawk's book, and he asked other AFD members to guess if these quotes were coming from Hitler's Mein Kampf or Hawk's book, and they were consistently wrong and misquoting Hitler or assigning things to Hawk that Hitler said and vice versa. Um, this is the type of guy we're dealing with here. Um, he's also been caught using Nazi stormtrooper, stormtrooper slogans. Um... I don't know what more evidence you need. Uh, I mean, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna play middleman. Sure. I, I I think the like these could definitely be taken. I think the Nazi stormtrooper slogan is the most damning one. Yeah. I mean, you can take a lot of phrases no, the or phrases, sentences out of books. Yes. Right. I'll go with you with that one. Um, I think the 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 Holocaust the, one. Yeah, that's I, ridiculous. I I don't because really? because it is a monument of shame. I mean, if you walk through Berlin, I visited Berlin. Yes. It's it's littered with monuments of shame and those are purposeful yes. because they're tools to make sure that they don't go they don't even think to go down that path anymore so the thing is it's truthful of course the the sentiment here is that we shouldn't be so shameful about it right which is wrong right but just as far as what we're specifically talking about here, yes. I don't have a problem with right. that. Right. Like, it, saying that there are monuments of shame scattered around Berlin, that's true. Yes. But the, the context of it being, so we need to take them down. That's the that's problem. That's the problem. That's yeah. the problem, right? So, now I kind of want to get your opinion on this, because I don't know where I am on it yet. Okay. Do you think the AFD should be banned? Because I don't know where I land yet. I don't know where I land. Um, yes. Yes, right? Yes, I do. Right? I do. Um, I think you cannot you cannot give the neo-Nazis and the far right an inch because they will take a mile. Well, yeah. And I think I'm, I'm saying this as someone who's not, I'm not informed enough. I am kind of assuming that they are essentially a party of neo-Nazis. Yes. I mean, like, I look, haven't dug into this. Is everyone in the AFD a neo-Nazi? No. Is everyone who supports the AFD a neo-Nazi? No. Is every Trump supporter a fascist? No. no. But Trump's a fascist. Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening here. Yeah. And we can't ban the Republican Party in the U.S. I think the fact that they can means... I, honestly, when I when I thought about this right after you just asked me, I'm like, what are going to be the effects? Well, I think the chances that serious unrest and... Um, economic and political and civil turmoil happen i think the chances of that are much higher if the afd is left to 
proliferate yeah. and spread propaganda throughout the German populace than if it is banned right now. No, no, Even though that. members, like current supporters, will be upset, that, like you need to stop this ball from rolling all the way down the mountain. Right. Yeah. And look, the AFD is currently surging. They are now the second largest party in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, they have recently passed the Social Democrats and the Greens. The AFD is sitting at 21%. Um, the social, uh, the social Democrats are at 18. The Greens are at 14. The center right is up at the top at 26. But the AFD being that high up is insane. Yeah. Um, for a party that was only formed in 2013, they're seeing a massive spike in support right now. And it's Germany needs to address this. It's shocking to me how low the left leaning coalitions are. The left, well, the left leaning coalition is like more like hardcore Soviet, oh, sympathetic, communist. Yeah, like more hardcore communist. Okay. Um. Yeah, the center, the, the left is very like um, uh, uh, communist, uh, um, idealistic. Okay, okay. Yeah, that and they're also sense. big supporters of Putin and Russia. Okay. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of issues with that too. Yeah, that's, that's. We're going to get it. Maybe we'll get a bunch of link supporters, link supporters right now in the comments. They're going to tell me I'm a shill and I'm wrong, but yeah. I, that's what I've seen. Hopefully. Um, yeah. I, the one thing, I think this prompts an interesting, more th philosophical discussion what exactly would the afd be banned for we're saying right. we're saying threat to democracy i think that works i right? think that works great i think i think that's kind of how specific you need to keep it because i compare it to other kind of polarization where I, I think about in america right if if we had say we have a bunch of different parties a coalition of them say there's one one specifically trump aligned party that's only like 25 percent. it's not the entire republican party and this trump party is they have a a particular like campaign or a platform point that is we want donald trump to be dictator banning that is different yes like like that is different than an entire republican party that's saying we think the democrats are evil mm-hmm and we need to beat them in all the elections. Yes. Because then the Democrats are just as guilty as the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it's interesting like where you draw that line and protecting democracy seems like a very good point to put it. Totally. Me. I think, I think like constitutions, specific, like liberal constitutions need to have it in there mm. that you need to be able to ban political parties once they are threatening an overthrow of the democratic order. You can take issue with the form of government. I'm okay with that. As long as you're trying to make it more democratic. Mm -hmm. If you're coming at it as you're an anti-democratic trying to use the democratic framework to reverse the progress of democracy, yeah. you can't be trusted with power and you shouldn't be anywhere near it. Um, mm. One thing I want to talk about the AFD. Germany has a history of banning parties, not just in the 50s, but in the 1870s. Uh, Otto von Bismarck banned the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, the same SPD, in the, in the 1870s. It did lead to them becoming more popular because they started operating underground. They actually used it as a sign of martyrdom, and they were able to use that as a selling point to get more people to join. I am worried that the AFD could do the same. But I am hopeful that the Germans trust their institutions enough that if their institutions came out and said, this party is a threat to democracy, they are a danger. We cannot let them anywhere near government. They will listen and they will understand. I don't think so. Well, the only re I, I know Germany has one of the highest levels of institutional trust out of any European nation. Mm. So that gives me hope. But um, I feel like the whole, like a major tactic of these far right movements is, is undermining trust into the institutions. Right. right? And I, I mean... It just echoes too much of what happens when Trump gets indicted. They like him more. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what I'm worried could happen in the AFD if they ban him. Yeah. They might become more popular. I don't know what the answer is. but I think you're right. But I also think like if they have this mechanism in Germany, just wait for them to pop up with another name and challenge democracy again and keep getting rid of them. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. I think that, that we shouldn't play with these guys at all. They're not funny. It's nothing to mess around with. Their campaign posters are like hearts. and the right has learned. Mm. You know what I mean? The mm -hmm. right isn't going to make the same mistakes it did last time. The The fascism of the future will not look like the fascism of the 1930s. No. The fascism of the future will do their 
best to paint themselves in nail polish and lipstick and make you think that they're nice and sweet before they come out with the anti-Semitism in the camp. So please do not be fooled by the rebranding. They are the same. They will always be the same. You can't rebrand far-right populist nationalism. It is what it is. And that's why it's popular, unfortunately. But it needs to always be defeated. And if the Germans can ban it, ban it right away. Cool. Hell yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go into what's going on in China because we have a lot to say. We have so there's so much happening in China right now. This is almost going to be like a mini deep dive. This is really crazy. I mean, we're going to keep doing the Chinese economic updates probably every month, every other week because this is insane. Yeah, the, it, I, I so I am of the opinion. I texted Anthony about this earlier this week. Uh, we are we are in the midst of watching an economic collapse in China right now. Yeah, that, I, I agree with you. Right now. Um, so why are we saying this? There's a bunch of reasons. First of all, new data came out about declining imports and exports um, that that now has gone through July. We talked about this last month, too. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see, is it a continued trend? Are they going to bounce back? Well, yeah, both imports and exports went down further than what we saw in the month of June. Um, Exports dropped 14.5% in July year over year. Imports fell 12.3%. Both were more than experts expected. Um, we're, we're kind of, we're seeing, we're seeing a spiral. We're seeing a spiral. We're seeing a tumble right now. The snowball is getting bigger and bigger as it's going down the hill. Mm-hmm. That's what's happening. The problem is getting worse and worse. One of the ways you can see this so much is imports falling alongside exports. China does a lot of manufacturing. And they need to import a lot of the things that they then build up, okay? Mm -hmm. China is not importing enough stuff to increase their exports anymore. And the world is turning against them, specifically the United States. On August 9th, the Biden administration passed an executive order that is now screening outbound investment. It's Mm -hmm. banning investment from uh, uh, of quantum computing, AI, and advanced chips from getting into China completely. Yeah. Um, 51% of American imports from low-cost Asian countries came from China last year, um, down from 66% when Trump was president. Yeah, the decoupling is very much happening. And the investment trends have been going down long before this executive order was released. A large part of that is because of the crackdown that Xi Jinping has initiated against specifically tech companies, but really almost any American company, like big American companies that are operating in China with the aim to increase the the strength of the grip of the CCP on its industries. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is China has relied heavily on this external investment over the entire course of its 40-year rise. They have been built on foreign direct investment. Yeah, and now it it just doesn't have the capacity internally. It doesn't have the capital to keep innovating and producing and so because of that i think we really are seeing a spiral where these countries are going to keep trying to remove investment from china as they get the as they continue to be scared that she is going to crack down too much they're not going to want to have operations they're going to they're going to shift manufacturing capacity to similar country similar cost countries like vietnam like thailand like mexico like mexico and i don't know how they get out of it I don't know how they get out of it either. I never thought that we'd be in a situation where I would say this, but it is now clear to me, China needs America more than America needs China. Yeah. I was under the impression that we needed China more. I was wrong. China needs us way more because they need us as a buyer. Yes. What is the evidence that they need us as a buyer? They are not only going through a decline in their exports and a decline in their imports, uh, their, their imports. They're going through a deflationary spiral right now. And we've heard a lot about inflation in the United States. Why is inflation bad? What inflation is bad because it limits your buying power. Well, deflation is really bad because it stops the encouragement of consuming. Mm -hmm. When you think that your dollars might be worth more later on, you're going to want to save your dollars. Mm -hmm. Your dollar isn't losing value. It's gaining value over time. It doesn't encourage consumption. And that's not helping the Chinese economy that's sitting on a bunch of products that it's used to exporting to the United States, but now there's no buyers on the international market. Yeah. And you, you can think about this from 
from the money supply, right? There, there are no buyers on the international market, so money isn't coming in that way. And it's the same way as far as, as labor, right? Mm-hmm. If the external investment isn't coming in to produce in China, then it means there's just less money in the economy. Less money in the economy means that prices have to go down. Yes. Something that's tangentially related to this that I was interested in is the the real estate crisis. Oh, yeah. Which we've... Oh, wait, before we move on to the real estate crisis, I want to say one more thing about the falling CPI, okay? So one of the reasons that it's getting so bad in China Mm. with this deflationary spiral is interest rates haven't fallen at the same rate as the CPI. The Chinese government is not responding by cutting interest rates where they should right now. Mm -hmm. So real interest rates are currently above the CPI. What does this mean? In economic terms, a positive real interest rate encourages saving and investment as rewards individuals and businesses for deferring consumption and putting money to work in productive activities. It can also influence consumer behavior by making it relatively more attractive to save rather than spend, which can have an impact on economic growth and monetary policy decisions. And that's exactly what we're happening, what we see happening now. Yeah, I think the the interesting thing is they're they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because if they lower rates, then they're probably going to be taking on more debt. Yes. Right. Because borrowing money is going to be cheaper and China's already, they already have a huge debt problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Again, it's like, where do they go with this? I don't know what kind of government policies they do to get out of this. Uh, So the reason I want to bring up the the real estate crisis, it kind of, it really reminded me of our conversation about healthcare last week. Because just like healthcare is an enormous percentage of America's GDP, real estate is the same thing for China. So China's real estate industry is 30% of their GDP, which where it's like 20 to 25% usually in other rich countries. A few, a couple of years ago, Evergrande, which is the second biggest property developer in, uh, in China, defaulted. Um, it meant the loss of a ton of confidence in their real estate industry. Investment went down a ton. Something very similar is about to happen with its biggest real estate developer, which is Country Garden. It missed debt payments last month, prompting, prompting fears of a default. And these debt payments were relatively small. So for them to miss them really shows how bad of a situation they're in. Um, And because of the reason this kind of connects to deflation is with the uncertainty in the real estate sector, the prices of building materials dropped 7% last month. Oh, man. So with with this decreased confidence in in real estate, which is 30% of the GDP... um, and in in some other industries like like high tech, right, where there's less investment coming in, where there's already the semiconductor war happening, there's less demand for these expensive materials, um, expensive services, and if there's less demand, then prices have to go down, and that yeah. contributes to deflation as well. Um, some of these property, some of the property sector's problems are structural, and we've talked about this as well. That China has plummeting birth rates. Um, it also has an extremely high youth unemployment rate. Uh, so that also influences young people to be less likely to get married. So right. there's this confluence of factors, which means that fewer young people are being put into a position to even buy new homes. Um, and since the economy is weakening, those young people are probably going to continue to face high unemployment and again, it's, it's, it's like, where are you going to go? I mean, and it's getting so bad. The Chinese have said that they are now officially no longer going to be reporting their Chinese youth unemployment numbers. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're not, uh, those numbers, we're not going to see them anymore mm-hmm. um, because it's getting so bad that if you, you know, that's the telltale sign right there. Yeah. This is the, um, this is the la- like last point that I had pretty much. There's, there's a campaign by the Chinese government really kind of across the board to become more opaque about the economy, mm-hmm. to project less finite like fewer financial woes than there actually are there are reports that um they've been instructing lawyers in ipo reports like not to paint that bad of a picture of the chinese economy so investors will be more willing to invest in those companies and that they've been telling economists to avoid discussing negative trends or use softer language in talking about the economy at large because they don't want to spook the people. Right. And they, I think the Chinese economy, what the, I think what they need, 
is a massive, massive stimulus package. Yeah. Because if you're going through a deflationary spiral, you need to put more money into that economy right now so the people have stuff to spend. They feel like there's money to burn mm -hmm. and they burn it because they need to, they honestly need to spark inflation. Yeah. They need to spark growth like that. They need to pass a stimulus package. Yeah. And I, I'm still, I don't know why they haven't. I think it's, it still is the, the fear of the debt. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause she over the last two, three years has really focused in on that as a huge problem for the economy is that that all these companies have been borrowing willy nilly and the real estate sector again is a huge part of this because yeah. specifically what happened there is these companies kind of built up a ponzi scheme almost mm -hmm. where they would start one project because people in china have been paying up front for apartments that they haven't even lived in you would like pay a developer to develop the building so you could <laughs> buy it at some other point in the future i'm gonna put this on the floor yeah good call um yeah, it's 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 a total mess, and then eventually those apartment buildings weren't even built. Yeah, they, that these people invested in. They would use the money that they got to start new projects, and then they just never follow through. And so now they're at this point where there are a ton of unfinished projects, and they have their their money has run out, so they can't actually buy. Even though the building costs are coming down, they can't buy the materials to to build them. Uh. And she looked at this and cracked down on those developers and was like, no, 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 you guys are doing the wrong thing. You should be building these apartments that you promised people. And that exact policy is what means that they, they can't do it. Now, then again, I think if he allowed them to keep borrowing at the rates that they were, then they probably right. would just keep doing the wrong thing. Yeah. I don't know. I think like an, an issue with the Chinese welfare state, which I think we should do a deep dive in at some point, because the Chinese welfare state is very interesting compared to the United States welfare state, but it's very regional. It's operated on a very regional basis, state by state in the Chinese government. It's not a very centralized welfare state. Like in the U.S., we have the Social Security system. China doesn't really have an equivalent to that. It doesn't really happen. Um, that makes it, I think, hard for the Chinese administration to get stimulus checks out to people and get stimulus packages out to every citizen. Mm. It makes it difficult for those reasons. Um, trying to do a national unemployment policy would be actually kind of difficult in China because of the welfare systems being unique to different states. Um, and the states having different funding mechanisms for all these different programs. Um, that's kind of similar to the states, but it's just different the way that our policy is organized and directed. Mm. So I think that there's a lot of issue with even trying to get a good demand-driven stimulus package out of the Chinese economy. It's so complicated. Yeah, they're in so, so deep right now. Um, I, I Again, I just think we, we see continued collapse. The demographics aren't there. The internal demand isn't there. I don't see them getting out well, of this. I got to tell you, because I, I, again, I'm a nerd who reads The Economist, right? So this was the cover of this week's Economist. Costly and dangerous, why Biden's China strategy isn't working. And they make the argument that the process of nearshoring and decoupling from China is backfiring. I don't agree with them, but I want to at least give those arguments because they are going on in the conversation around this moment we're in with the Chinese economy. So... The issue that The Economist is outlining is that trade with China and America is going down, yes, but trade with China and America's allies is rising at the moment. And this is indicating, one, possibly that American allies are now becoming packaging hubs for Chinese goods. That's argument number one. And then the second argument is that more countries are receiving Chinese investment that are American allies. One example of this is Mexico. Chinese companies have exported $300 million a month in parts to Mexico and in car parts to Mexico, and that is more than twice the amount they managed five years ago. Um, another example that the economist gave was that China used to, ex used to uh, provide 3% of automotive parts to Eastern Europe. This is being Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania. But now China is providing 10% of automotive parts, a 7% gain in, three, in five years. What does this mean? Um, the Economist is arguing that when a push comes to shove, perhaps these American allies um, would actually choose China over America if the Chinese and, and, and the American allies' economies become so intertwined. If Mexico is now getting all of their input materials from China, what is the incentive to stick with America? Now, my rebuttal to that is America is Mexico's demand. So Mexico has to take the 
Mexico has to decide. Is it going to side with their supplier or their buyer? We are their buyer. China is their supplier. Who are they going to side with? Now, I think that America has an opportunity to also become Mexico's supplier. But that's that's an interesting, that's hard. Well, I think I think the key here is for America to build out its allied sphere enough to cover every part of the supply chain. Mm. Like so have maybe America, China in that supply chain. So maybe America doesn't have to give Mexico the inputs, but maybe a Philippines could give Mexico the inputs. That's it. That's the answer. Yeah. That's the answer. I because so. the reason we're saying America can't provide the inputs is because when an economy um, modernizes and grows and becomes more service oriented, we go on, we have more high value added tasks in the production of things. Mm -hmm. So we develop software, we, de we develop internet and in, in, um, intellectual property, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we develop, we do analysis, we do analysis, right? We do these high value added activities where smelting or creating the steel or, you mining know, it. mining the steel, that's not some, or mining the steel, the mining the iron you need. That's not something America is going to be in the business of because that's lower on the value added chain. Mm -hmm. A developing country would see that opportunity to take that part of the, the, the supply chain and would love that because to go from subsist, subsistence farming to raw material exporting is a huge jump yeah. in productivity and value adding. That's going on in Latin America right now. Latin America has seen a boom in their resources um, in, in resources and commodities like that, like lithium, like copper. Mm -hmm. And Latin America has a new way out of poverty if they are able to take advantage of these raw materials and get them on the international market. But my point is, um, America's trouble is to not is to keep not just their economy from being entangled with China, but keep their allied countries not entangled with China. Yeah, which does mean their hands are really full. And yes. the one thing I'll say that that would really throw a wrench in this argument and that Unfortunately, since this is not our full-time job, I, I can't speak authoritatively on is how much of these raw materials are are in our allied countries, right? Like, because that's that's kind of the black and white. Like, if all of the copper is in China, we kind of have to bite the bullet and find an agreement that allows us to do that. Well, the material we talk about a lot is gallium, right? China is, what, 90, 80% of the international supply of gallium? Mm -hmm. The United States has a gallium supply, but again, we're not on that side of the value chain. Yeah, it's a really, it's a tough economic equation for us because we really can't, like, as soon as we started up gallium refinery or, or mining, basically China's just going to infuse a bunch of government funds into their own gallium production, flood the international market with it so that it's completely not economically viable for us those companies that are doing it in the u.s will be forced to shut down and then once again china will have complete power over the material and can restrict it whenever they want yes because it's not a, it's not a it, we're not playing on the same playing field because america needs to operate in the profit motive where the chinese economy could just funnel subsidies to these companies um that they could just you know not make a profit for a super long time where america can't do the same yeah um, let's talk more about these trade relationships. You have something on here about U.S. Canada, right? Yeah, which was super interesting. So, the the U.S. and and its global allies, um, or just just pretty much the whole entire international community, have been working on a way for other countries to collect taxes from big tech companies. Think Microsoft, Google, Meta. Um, the problem has been that these companies will write off sales to tax havens. Mm. Think like Apple in Ireland uh, because they can and because they're selling things all over the world. And the the international community is like, they're doing all this business in our country. We should get some of the tax income, some of the tax revenue from that business. Well, the U.S. and has been negotiating with these countries for over three years now on an agreement to distribute taxation uh, because these are American companies. Of course, right. that's where they get this bargaining power. And just recently, they had proposed to postpone the implementation of the agreed upon tax rules until 2025 when it had been in 2024. Mm. And Canada didn't like this because they had already there had already been 
um, delays to implementations of these taxes. And honestly, as I read it, I was, I was like, uh, this is us being the bad guys. This is where the baddies sad. Where the baddies. Um, because there is no specific timeline that's been put out on like when the negotiations might conclude. Yeah. And it very much seems like the U S is kind of just pushing the, the ball down the road. Uh, so Canada is like, we're going to implement our own digital services tax on these companies. And the U.S. is furious. And they have been lobbying to make sure Canada doesn't do it. Janet Yellen has been in touch with the foreign minister in Canada. Wow. Um, and we're really just, we're in, we're now risking a trade war with Canada. Because we've publicly, the Biden administration publicly said that this act could in uh, it could precipitate retaliation from the u.s Mm -hmm. which means we could put tariffs on canada um and it's really just some tension that we could do with not having yeah i mean canada we want to try to keep the north american continent as solid as the economic block as we can Mm -hmm. i want to know why the biden administration is reluctant to let this thing go through I do think they're they're expecting we lose a lot of tax revenue. I I oh, looked sense. at like three different articles on this. None of them went that in depth. I was trying to like really wrap my head around the specifics of it, and I could I ended up not finding the the information to really get there. Mm-hmm. But that's my assumption. Right, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's an attack on U.S. revenue, and I get that, but it's not really our revenue because this the, the business is being done in the other country. Exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. It is. Um, now we have uh, a big piece of American politics going on. Yeah. We have a couple big bills that have to get passed every couple years. We have the National Defense Authorization Act, which is done with, and now we have the Farm Bill. Yeah. So the Farm Bill comes around. Authorization has to be done every five years. The Farm Bill includes a lot of subsidies for our agricultural sector in America, and it also funds SNAP food stamps. So there's this coming divide that the Republican Party sees that now is becoming kind of routine in the House between the Freedom Caucus, the far right Republicans, and the more moderate Kevin McCarthy led coalition. Mm -hmm. So the Freedom Caucus is already loud about how we need to cut funding to SNAP because we need to cut down government spending in general. Uh, But these other Republicans, these more moderate Republicans who often represent rural or poor districts yep. are worried about cuts to the farm bill. Um, so they're already projecting that they might see this this standoff in Congress and they're already talking about how we have to make sure that this conflict doesn't make its way to the floor and we get it resolved beforehand. But the thing this, that this Politico article said is that they're not really moving anyone like they're aware that it's a problem but they're not actually fixing it no and democrats have an incentive here to really put the republicans on the fire get the fire again because during the whole debt ceiling fight that we talked endlessly about when we first started this podcast and journey one of the negotiations between mccarthy and biden was to do a cut of food stamps literally right after that deal was signed democrats said I don't care what was in the debt ceiling fight. I am going to fight to get the cuts in food stamps back into the farm bill. And we said, watch out for the farm bill because this fight's going to be a train wreck because Democrats are going to die on that hill. Yep. And we have Republicans who want to cut more things than what was in the debt ceiling fight. We have Democrats saying that we don't want to cut the agreement of the debt ceiling. Um, and then we have people, the Republicans in the middle, who just want to get what they passed basically like a three months ago Mm -hmm. and now um and i don't think democrats are going to really sign on to that no they have they have no incentive to no the democrat constituency is not farmers believe it or not yeah you know what i mean but they do but the democratic constituency is user snap yes and so i i I think that the republicans will end up losing the freedom caucus taking a few democrats on their side and thus what i think we're going to see is like very small cuts to snap yeah i mean what was the cuts in the debt ceiling negotiation it was like uh people over the age of 55 who were unemployed 
lose access to food stamps. Still millions of people. Yeah. Right. Well, it was, it was, yeah, it was over 55 and it was like maybe adding work requirements. I think it was my, maybe adding work requirements too. For some other small group of yeah. people. Um, yeah. It's been a while since we read about that stuff, but that's like yeah. kind of the vibe that they're trying to push with that, right? Adding work requirements to food stamps, limiting it to people who are kind of more on the elderly side, um, the almost out of working age and your retirement, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but that's where they're looking to cut food stamps. And I can't think of a more can't think of a more vitriolic thing than to go after food stamps yeah. right i mean like why food stamps in this article i think or maybe in some other article uh it it had a graph of people who were above the poverty line versus below it on food stamps versus off okay and i think it's like a 15 percent difference of how many people are over the poverty line or under based on the presence of food stamps wow yeah and it's weird because to me, like, I think of food stamps as a pretty weak program right? a lot of the time. But that's such a huge difference. No, that's a massive difference. Yeah. We're keeping 15% of people out of poverty with food stamps is what you're telling me? I, I, I'm scared to be quoted, but yeah, it's I'm not something quote like that. that. The point is we're keeping people out of poverty through food stamps. Even yeah. if it's 2%, it's worth the money. It's a lot of people. It's millions of people. Millions of people. Right. Yeah. So, again, uh, I don't understand why SNAP is the thing that they choose to go after. There's plenty of other things. Maybe less bullets, maybe less guns, but no. They're going to go after the butter. Yeah. Like always. Of course. Of course. Or, again, we'll, we'll always advocate just just tax more. Or just tax more. Yeah. The debt's a problem, guys. The debt sucks. Our interest payments suck. Mm-hmm. We talked about that last week. Please, raise taxes on the rich. Yeah. Okay? And me. And me. Yeah, raise my taxes. We're rich enough. Yeah, raise my taxes, please. Yeah. I want it. I want you to raise my taxes. Yeah. And right? use them well. Yes. And use them well. Make Get more people on food stamps, maybe. Maybe give more people health care. Yeah. All right? And then I'll gladly pay more in taxes. Totally. Um, you ready to go deep? I'm ready to go deep. <laughs> I'm ready to go deep. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> All right. So today we are going to talk about the universal basic income, which to me is kind of nice because we've been we've been going deep into these really sprawling topics recently. Like it was healthcare <laughs> last week. Um, this is a much more specific policy proposal, which uh, which is interesting to me. And we've we've talked about it a little bit. And I think we kind of sit on a similar like in a similar place but i also think we'll we can have a good discussion about it the so, abstract of our opinion it's a cool idea but we have a lot of concerns yeah i'm not sure it will work in reality yeah so first of all let's lay out i mean most people have probably heard of the universal basic income from andrew yang's 2020 campaign but what this is is a cash payment to each individual not to each household that comes every month probably, or every two weeks or something like that. It's a regular payment that is universal, goes to every person in the country, um, and unconditional. That Basically, works? that's it. Cool. Um, before we, I, I want to give a little bit of background on the history of UBI, because mm-hmm. it's actually a lot older than we think. Um, uh, Thomas Paine, the guy who wrote Common Sense, which was like the American pamphlet of why we need to have a revolution in the United States, right? After mm-hmm. the Boston Massacre. Um, in 1797, he actually proposed a uh, UBI. He called it the ground rent. Um, and <laughs> the ground rent uh, taxed landowners once a generation. And that money would then pay for the needs of people who had no land. Mm. Um, it was so interesting. He would uh, the, His proposal was to tax all, tax all direct inheritance by 10%, pay 10 pounds each year to every person over the age of 50, and give 15 pounds to every person once they reach the age of 21. And this is like a little bit of a proto-UBI that's being thought up in 1797 of how do we tackle the, the, the contradiction between those who own and those who don't own, and how do we kind of share the prosperity of the country? So even as far back as 1797, these ideas are kind of under the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, this continues, obviously, and we see the, a big explosion of a UBI equivalent in, ni- in 1968 with Milton Friedman, our neoliberal boy. He decided that a good idea would have negative 
tax rates, negative income tax rates. So if you made below a certain poverty level, a certain income level, instead of paying taxes, you got money back from the government. It's like a tax credit rather than like a direct cash payment, right? Mm -hmm. um, there were other examples, um, but I think those are the two really interesting ones. And now obviously we have Andrew Yang's example yeah, the ten, the, that we're all very familiar with, I think. The $1,000 a month for every month for every American. Mm -hmm. They kind of exist on this spectrum of total universality. Is it a one-time payment or is it forever? Is it is it truly universal? By Does it have any requirements alongside it? But the point is really direct cash payments, tackling the problems of the cost of living, generally with limited restrictions. Mm. Yeah, I do. I do think the universality is really... Imp like that level of specificity is important once we get to some of the implications yeah. of the policy later on. Definitely. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of places to go for this. I have some notes on the potential need for something like a UBI with the advent of automation yeah. and AI. Uh, it's an idea I've read about a lot, obviously because AI is kind of everywhere now skyrocketing in popularity right now uh there's a lot of fear that jobs are going to be taken um there was one projection i think that ai would would make like 500 million jobs obsolete in the next five or ten years and that was complete just like grasping for it in some fuzzy cloud in my mind so don't quote me on that mm -hmm. but the idea is that ai could take a lot of jobs away from people and so with the worry of the owners of AI just becoming trillionaires while everybody else suffers in poverty, it's like, how can we make sure that doesn't happen while also taking advantage of the enormous productivity gains that we can get from this technology? Let's just give people money regardless of working, mm -hmm. and then we don't have to worry about that. Um, this is kind of, it goes along with a theory that's been a long, around for a long time. It's called theory of skill-biased technological change. Well, um People have, technology has been developing for a long time, and people have often thought that it was going to take away jobs, and usually it hasn't. Uh, people have adapted the technology and kind of worked alongside it to become more productive. But some people think that it, it ends up making life much harder for low-skilled workers yeah. versus high-skilled workers. So the idea is that there's a demand for those with the skills to use new technology. So their wages go up, but a simultaneous decrease in demand happens for those without those skills. Yeah. And so this is something that we've, we see in the data since the, the seventies with uh, increasing income inequality and wealth inequality uh, that is kind of supported by a theory like this because of course in the seventies we get personal computers and then the internet comes along and technology is just really rapidly developing. However, the, the B, there was a Bureau of labor, labor statistics paper from last year that analyzed trends for jobs that are commonly cited as threatened by new technologies. Um, and they didn't see a significant decline between 2008 and 2018 or a projected decline from 2019 to 2029. So this isn't this is iffy. This is still more speculative. Um, and I, I mean, to me, there seems like it seems like there's credence to the idea that a more general AI will have a significant impact on more of the workplace. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm of the belief that technology doesn't really kill jobs that often to be honest i think it just creates new ones i don't know i i i've never really been fully convinced that technology will come and take all of our jobs away from us you know i'm not a luddite um i don't i just don't i never had that view i even with chat gpt nowadays i view it as an extension of my knowledge and a tool for me to utilize at work rather than my replacement do you think though that like like a programming team of five will become a programming team of two. That's possible. But now I think that those other three programmers are going to find more higher value added jobs. I think that might be true. You know what I mean? Like yeah. those, 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 like those jobs might be killed, but it opens the opportunity for more things higher up on the value chain. Because mm. now what this AI is doing is it's determining it. We've now decided 
we we've now changed what is high value added and what isn't mm. you know what i mean so it's people are going to develop new skills to create more value rather than you know trying to spend eight minutes on eight hours on stack overflow figuring out how to make a second submit button on a user interface yeah you know what i mean yeah i think the only thing i'm worried about is if it goes far enough that the only people with money are the people who have come up with novel ideas and own their own businesses definitely that they make with chat gpt now that's my problem because my problem with technology is not it itself my problem is the question of ownership and what i feel ubi lacks is an address to the problem of ownership, right? And what we're basically becoming at that point when we go and we say, we're going to do a UBI, honestly, this is how I view this. We are almost like we are getting the scraps of a hyper-productive economy that is making people extremely wealthy, and then we're just basically getting the scraps of whatever they're able to give down to us. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to be invested in the automated revolution. I want all of us to have a stake in these massive companies that are going to be driving forward with AI and automation and, you know, doing as much as they can with automating the manufacturing processes. The American people should have an ownership stake of that. And when I view that, I think of, this is like how I think about this, right? Like the American Department of the Treasury buys the stocks of these publicly traded companies like 20 percent 30 percent and they become voting bodies that we can then vote for and whatever and then that money that gets dividend payments from those stocks gets sent to us mm -hmm. that's my view of a ubi i don't want the ubi to just be something that we tax them and then get it i want it to be something that the united states government and the people have ownership over can regulate can be tied to their success like a sovereign wealth like fund. a sovereign wealth fund which i, I am a huge proponent of a sovereign wealth fund okay massive proponent hmm. and that's what i want to see i want to see dividend payments come in my mailbox through these massive companies and oligopolies that are able to totally take over the ai and automation markets so what do you what do you think of the argument that that's kind of already done by massive fund companies like blackrock and Vanguard? it doesn't happen the number of people that are in the stock market are so little and so small. It's like 10% of the United States own stocks. 10% of people in the U.S. own stocks. Really? Yeah. Okay. Like how many, how, what's the percent of people that you think have a 401k? Uh, 30. 30? That's, okay. I'm thinking it's going to be like 25. Okay. Well, if it's 25, then that's, I mean, those people are all in the stock market. Yeah. So 401k options for many, only 60 million Americans contribute to one. Only 60 million Americans. There's 330. Yeah. So it's less than 20%. It's less than 20%. Less than 20% have a 401k. How many of those guys who don't have a 401k have a brokerage account that they're just day trading with? Some. I mean, not day trading, but there are some that invest. Yeah. Maybe have a Roth IRA, but don't have a 401k or something. But the point is that it's not enough of the actual economy to matter. Like the, the average, the, the, the American people are not invested in the stock market enough. I don't know if that's, I mean, uh, to say it's not enough of the economy to matter, I would kind of strongly disagree with. You think? BlackRock manages 10 trillion. Vanguard manages 8 trillion. This is, I mean, this is more... This is a large percentage of the American GDP. Yes, but are we are we like actively voting on the board of directors with those shares? They do, but I mean, honestly, we talked about Vivek earlier. One of the things that Vivek harps on the most is how the the ESG cult yeah. has taken over America, and there and Larry Fink of BlackRock and other um, executives of these of these massive fund companies are voting and implementing their will on how the company should be run. Um, in a way that fits with environmental and social governance, which mm -hmm. is a terrible thing, apparently. Yeah, so bad. Um, so I do think they have power. Like, I, I, I was looking into this. I think it's just a battery. I know. Low. I just want to get the screen back up. Sure. Yeah. So ESG. I, yeah. Well, I was looking. I was looking at uh, a few, a few big companies, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Exxon, random stuff, 
And oh, for, for all of them, the biggest shareholder is BlackRock. Is BlackRock or Citadel Vanguard or Vanguard or one yeah. of those guys? Yeah, and I, I get that, I understand, but this is this is uh, this is I think this is more important. Okay, ten percent of people in America own eighty four percent of all the stocks. That is not a fair distribution of economic influence. Mm. And if we had thirty percent of companies, or if we had the American government in the in the business of getting involved with these corporations, taking some ownership, and then paying us for it, mm. they would be able to dictate the people's will better than the 10% of people who own 84% of the stock market. Okay. I understand that people are reluctant about the government getting involved in private industry, but like, I don't want you to view it that way. I want you to view it as you're getting involved in private industry. Yeah. Your voice is now at the corporate boardroom table. Your interests are getting discussed because someone you voted for is working for your interest and they're there representing you. It's not some nebulous concept. I think it's really, it's really hard. Like it's hard to argue that in practice. Yes, sure. Because I think it's really like it would be easy to assign some executive body to manage the fund or something or to manage the the voting but it would be hard to add that to congress's plate because there are going to be so many companies like so many things it doesn't have to, to be congress's on. plate i'm sorry but they could be a p people who are appointed by the executive and approved by the congress okay and that's what i want to see that's what i want okay that's what i want to see i guess and I, that's... I mean i think there's so almost like how Supreme Court justices are done. Yeah, and how cabinet officials are done. Okay. Right? Like, you know, how cabinet officials are done, how how ju how court, how justices and judges are appointed. Do you think it would be different per president? Because you're still just going to get purely partisan. That's fine. Let it be purely partisan. That's the goal. That's the joy of politics. Let that happen. But this system needs to be created. Just because it's more important to get to have people. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to say we're not going to say the EPA isn't worth having just because Republicans come in and, you know, dump mm -hmm. it every four years, mm -hmm. eight years. It's still worth having for those moments when we get you know good representation at the EPA. Sure, but I think this is this is different because the EPA can't really be weaponized to do actively bad things to the environment, like this voting power might be able to do actively bad things within corporate entities. Mm. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think it depends. I think as far as like the American people being represented, I think it might end up looking kind of the same as a UBI. Cause I think the importance of them having ownership would be to reap some of the profits of these companies. Yeah, but that's fine. I just don't like the idea of having no power in the game. And that's a very distinct difference, I think. Okay. I think we're just kind of entrusting the private, in the, the capital industrial leaders mm. to throw us a bone with the taxes rather than put us at the bargaining table with them. It might in practice look almost similar, but I don't like the idea of not being at the table helping make those decisions. And mm. I want the government in there. It really does attack the very foundations of capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, again, other specific questions, how big does a company need to get to, is it, is it required? Like, can they specifically not sell shares to the government if they want to? Um, and those questions get really hard to answer. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I think, you know, that that's an argument for another day. If private companies should be allowed to exist past a certain point. Yeah. Right. That's a whole other topic. But if there are, the point is UBI does not tackle the problem of ownership. Mm hmm which I think is actually the main issue with our economy, not just distribution. Sorry, I'm just going to linger on this a That's little fine. more. Is it ownership by the people if the people don't get to... Like, like your ownership, I'm thinking about owning stock in a company, right? But people don't get to decide whether to buy and sell. But I guess you're saying the, the elected slash appointed yes. officials will. Yes. So it counts. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think that it's works. about spreading the idea of representative Republican democracy to every aspect of our lives. Yeah. And that includes the corporate boardrooms. Okay. That's what it's about. Okay. Getting that in, in, as much as possible in every boardroom. Mm. Um, 
We went off on a tangent there, but that was really good. We yeah. hadn't talked about that. That was super interesting. So now I want to talk about some of the effects that I've seen um, from UBIs. Yeah. So I've, I've seen that UBIs are very effective in not developed countries. But they're not very effective in fully developed countries. Okay. So I've seen where when you have a fully developed country that has a fairly okay social safety net, like the U.S., when I say fairly okay, I mean like still not good, but functional. It's like not as effective to get rid of all of those and put in place a UBI. Hmm. Whereas if you're in a poor developing country, it's actually really hard to build up the administrative state necessary to run these social programs. So a UBI is super effective. Interesting. I haven't, I don't think I've seen the same thing. Yeah, no. but, I, but I haven't seen, I mean, I haven't really seen any UBI experiments. There's not a lot of BI experiments in, the, in places like the US. I've seen a lot of basic income yeah. programs. Um, but but I've, I've only seen really effective results from almost all of the basic income programs. These are simulations. These are not true. Okay. These are not true live experiments. These that are these are simulations by the International Monetary Fund. Okay, That's I have what this is. I have seen the same thing in developing countries okay. where, where UBI is more effective. And honestly, because of the capitalistic institutions that are much more robust and further developed in developed countries, mm -hmm. it doesn't surprise me. Right. Um, because I think those developed capitalist institutions are going to be much more likely to exploit the recipients of UBI. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So, I mean, I've, I, I, you probably have more to talk about on the effects, but the effects I've seen are, are generally all good. Again, with basic income experiments, not with universal basic income experiments. The effects on demand, um, obviously demand increases when you give poorer people money because they can spend it. And they want to spend it. And poor people spend money more often than rich people. Yes. As a larger percentage of their income goes to consumption. Yes. Always. Always. Um, the effects on poverty decreases poverty. Obviously. Obviously. Changes based off of developing versus advanced countries. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a, the, the, it's a negative 5% point difference in reduction of poverty in developing countries. Like 1% to 2% points in a fully developed country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, effects on labor. They're, on labor. They're small based on the aggregate of experiments that I've seen. But if they do exist, they're likely positive. Which is so interesting that it was positive. Because the general consensus when you argue about UBI is like, no one's going to want to work anymore if you get paid for sitting at home. Yeah. But this Finland study actually showed people worked six days more on average. Mm. Um, when they got the UBI. Now, that wasn't what the experiment was controlling for per se. So like they didn't want to conclude it for sure that that was like a causal relationship. But it's interesting correlation at least. I think it kind of, I think it makes sense because yeah. it means that you're able to find a job that you like. Yeah, you're able, yeah. Something that you're really that. passionate about. Yeah. Um, if, if the effects on labor are ever negative, it's because people are using the time for other valued activities like caregiving or educating themselves. Yes. Um, which means that this also has a positive effect on education, though experiments I saw were only positive in the short run and meh in the long run, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is telling in something I'm going to get back to. Yeah. The effects on health, including mental health, are very, very positive. Very positive. Um, so generally, like the effects are all good for basic income. Right. And all of these experiments pretty much go into it and they're they're rarely universal and they'll they'll be they'll caveat and say, We want to give money to people who make under two hundred percent of the poverty level. Right. Or we want to give money to um mothers at two hundred fifty percent of the poverty level. Um and we're going to do it for a year. Right? Because these are experiments, so they can't say we're, we're gonna do this experiment forever. Right now, the longest one that's ever been planned is happening in Kenya, and it started in 2017, oh, and great. it's planning on going for 12 years. Uh, but we can't really use that to analyze anything about how it would work in a developed country, obviously. Right. So because of these experimental limitations, there are these fundamental questions about UBI that I don't think have actually been answered. Yep. 
will UBI, UBI make people not want to work? Well, we just talked about these effects on labor being small, but if people know that they're always going to be getting this income, well, they'd be like, okay, I can just sit at home, whatever. Like these people knew the study was ending. Yes. So does that mean they're more motivated to go out and get a job and prove themselves while maybe they are more mentally healthy and able to motivate themselves to do so Mm -hmm. and find jobs that they like a little bit more. We can't, we can't say either way. No. Same way. Okay. Well, will UBI improve standards of living? I think that's almost certainly true. Yeah, definitely. Some of these will stay consistent, but then you have the issue of like, what will UBI do to the market? And this is something that none of these experiments have ever really looked at. They've always been, what's the effect on the individual? Because I think a very intuitive question that both of us have asked is, why does a UBI not mean a subsequent equal increase in rent? Yeah. Right? If a, if a, if a landlord knows that you are getting a $1,000 check in the month, uh, check in the mail every month, they're going to do everything they can to get that $1,000 from you. Yeah. And they, and they know that you were able to afford the thousand dollar rent before so now you're going to be able to afford two thousand dollars yeah they're just gonna charge that um since existing experiments have requirements on the income that people who are participating have it means that even locally they're not universal right it's not like a whole town is getting an amount of income it's not like a whole apartment building is getting uh all the same income exactly right and so because they haven't been universal, landlords aren't really, a, like, they can't know which of their tenants are getting the UBI. And so they can't just, you know, they can't raise all of their rents um, for risk of driving all of their tenants out. But if a UBI is announced and it's like, okay, this is always going to be coming in, then I think we really do see rents skyrocket. I think you will. Possible. I think you'll see it. A massive amounts of increase in prices and all the things that you need to survive. Yeah. I don't think commodity prices get affected too much, to be honest. But I think the things that you need, I think food goes up. I think rent goes up. I think healthcare goes up. I think education goes up. I think all those things go up almost proportionally to the UBI, in my opinion. That's what I think would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one argument uh, There's one argument written by Matt Buring uh, in the uh, uh, People's Policy Project. And he he's, hates this. He's like, if you say that UBI causes inflation, well, then you're arguing against all um, Social Security benefit increases. You're arguing against all minimum wage increases. And I think the point that we're trying to make is not really because those aren't universal. Mm -hmm. They can't do price discrimination. Remember, we, we talked about price discrimination a long time ago. You can't discriminate on someone because they're 65 years old and you know their social security went up so you can raise their rent specifically to get their social security costs mm-hmm. but if you know that everyone is getting that thousand dollars yeah you can go after everybody on a, like, and without de- price discriminating yeah which is sad because you you talk about how universality is an aim that you have in your policy proposals it is it makes it administratively less burdensome uh it makes it less politically divisive because it's not... I mean, it, it increases the solidarity all over the class structure. Yeah, but I, I I haven't seen enough evidence. This is one of those things where I, I want to be shown the evidence. I've seen the argument that UBI won't be inflationary, but I, I haven't... I, it hasn't been made well enough to me mm-hmm. to actually agree and resonate with it. So I'm hoping... Someone will write something that really makes that point solid in my mind. Um, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And I think like America kind of did a UBI experiment during the American Rescue Plan where mm-hmm. we passed the trial tax credit and we gave everybody under who forever we gave everyone uh, $250 for every child they had under 16 or 300 for every child under 16 and 250 between 16 and 18. Point is, we gave everyone like a check in the mail every month mm-hmm. and the world didn't explode. It didn't, I don't think it, it caused the inflationary spiral that we had because uh, the whole world saw it and not every not every country passed a child tax credit. Mm-hmm. Um, and some countries are, have worse inflation than us, than we do right now. Um, all of Europe has worse inflation than we do. So I, it didn't cause that. Um, and again, I think it's kind of because it's not universal. And I, I like the idea of a, of a basic income that's centered around taking care of children and promoting family generally yeah i'm in favor of stuff like that yeah um i've seen like they're they're 
there's been policies in Italy that's trying to get more money to families so that to encourage um, uh, uh, reproduction, yeah. right? To encourage baby Higher making. Birth rates. And it didn't really work, but that's not really where I'm coming from with it. I'm not trying to get more birth rates mm -hmm. or increase the birth rate. I'm just trying to make it easier to have a kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's Which could increase birth rates, but that's not the point. It's not the point. Yeah. Right. I, okay. I think, I think the last place that I want to go on this is okay. If UBI isn't the way mm -hmm. and someone like me, I really would really would like to see policies that provide everyone's basic needs yeah. across the board. I think that's that's kind of my gold my like north star when I think what do we need as as a country and kind of what should any rich country be doing for its citizens. It really is disheartening that UBI isn't the way because it seems like the easiest way. I know. Um but I'll tell you why. I'm going to kick you off. Sure. It's because we're trusting the market with the UBI. Yeah. What we're doing with the UBI is we're saying the market is the best way to distribute resources, but not everybody has access to the market. So let's just give everybody access to the market. But the truly hard thing to accept is that the market is the problem. The market isn't the solution. Mm -hmm. The market is the thing that we have to tackle in the UBI um, as as we've seen or as we've talked about here, not being the best idea is evidence that the market is not the solution. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'd say the market the market is both. So the mark in this case, the market's the problem. Yeah. In other ways, the market often is the solution. Mm. Um, but a, a highly regulated market really is the only like like this the unfortunate truth is this needs to be really fine-tuned to a high extent to work. Um, and I, I do think public ownership of those basic needs mm -hmm. and public production of those yep. is really the only way. Agreed. And I went down rabbit holes of like thinking how this could work. And it 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 kind of frightens me how difficult it gets. Oh, yeah. Because think about something like food, right? Like you, if you pour if you pour money into food subsidies, if you pour money into food stamps, like increase food stamp funding instead of decrease it, do food prices go up? Maybe, maybe not because it's not universal, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's a risk that seems like it'll be politically difficult. I don't think food prices would ever be a problem. I'm almost in favor of universal food stamps. Really? I, yeah, I'm okay. almost in favor of universal food stamps if everybody, well, uh, universal food stamp, uh, maybe not universal, but progressive food stamp recipients, mm. right? So like if you're really under the poverty line. You get a certain higher number than to someone who's making a lot of money. Mm. Um, but I like the idea of everybody getting a little bit of food stamps. I think I like that idea. I think you need to you would need to ensure like like very common or ve a, a very high density of grocery stores, basically. Because I think well, then I have another solution for you. Okay, but this is a whole other topic that we could do a deep dive on. But um, I love the idea of public of 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 uh, municipal owned food stores. And these are very popular in rural Republican deep red communities mm. where they don't have their no grocery store. It, it's not profitable for them mm. to hold refrigerators full of produce. Sure. So the community gets their tax revenue together at the municipal level and creates a food store that has the broccoli, has all the refrigerated goods. And then they buy the food and then only sell the food back to the population um, to keep the thing running. I guess my question is, how do they price it? They price it just to keep the store running. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so instead of so trying it's a to find profit, it's a nonprofit, but run by the municipality. Interesting. So that do do all so all grocery stores become government owned? Um, I think there should be a there should be a public option. Yeah, 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 yeah. There should be a public option. I like that, and yeah. it can be like a public option every square mile. Yeah, or at least in urban areas. Right. Um, see you guys i like that we're fixing it yes yes <laughs> listen to us we're fixing um, it please um yeah, i like that a lot yeah dude. um because there needs and i mean it's the same thing with housing like we same need thing with housing. we need a more robust so if we have a robust public food supply and a robust public housing supply these are the market controls that are necessary 
to make sure that the UBI private is actually sector, good. Yeah, that the private sector doesn't run away and exploit the hell out of the little guy. Right, and that UBI could actually be really effective if we take food and housing out of the equation. Yes. And then if we take education out of the equation, then UBI is gold. Yeah. Right? And take healthcare out of the equation. Like that's when we get UBI actually being effective as long as we remove the needs from the market. Yeah, totally. If we if we put the if these basic needs are priced at nonprofit level, mm -hmm. then I, I mean the way we're describing this, it sounds utopian. Uh, kinda. But that's the point. All right. But you know, we, the practical implications and implementations of these things, um, it's it's all downstream of what you want to see, and I have seen nonprofit municipality run grocery stores. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's easy. That's easy. Getting them every square mile, that's a hard part. But making them, that's an easy thing to do mm. if you have the drive and you get political power and you push for it, right? Yeah. And uh, you tax. And you tax. And you tax. Yeah. And, and I, tax. I think that's, to me, it's all downstream of that. Yeah. Tax. Raise taxes, get the money to do these things, and then you can invest in these measures that are going to completely control the market and crunch down the income inequality and make lives better for everyone and isn't that the goal guys yeah. isn't that the goal just to make lives better yeah. that's our goal with the show to make Amen. your life better yeah i like i like we're ending we're ending with an actual like it doesn't seem futile like, have it we seems like there's a direction have we ever ended a show optimistically before i don't know i think this might be a first our deep dives are rarely sunshine and rainbows I know, right so um well guys it's been a pleasure talking to you from long island We'll be back in Boston soon. Yes. And the setup won't be as bad, but it will be just as bad as always. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, people. Goodbye.